Would you, would you turn with me this morning then to um, the book of Exodus, chapter 33. That's where I want to start this morning. I'm going to try to deal with a new series on looking for God's glory. Exodus chapter 33. Let's read together verses 18 through 23. Verses 18 through 23 from Exodus 33. Amen. Tell it, lady, and we have to pray for one another. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Would you turn with me this morning? And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. That's where I want to start this morning. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Let's read together. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock. And will cover thee and will be gracious with my hand whom I will be gracious, while and I, I pass will show by. Mercy on whom I will and I will take away mine hand, and, and thou said, shalt see my back thou parts, not see my face, but my face for there shall, shall not no man be see seen. Me and live. This, of course, is a conversation and between said, God and Moses. Behold, there is a place and here is a place in Scripture where I think historically we can learn so much and it shall so many times pass, from the Israelites. We learn a lot about our own ways. That I will put and um, I'm thinking law. almost we can see that and history does repeat itself. With my hand. I think one of the greatest needs in our world today is the presence of the glory of God. But my faith, I believe that we need to look for the glory of God as we never have before. I believe we need to be so concerned about His glory that everything else, every problem, the pandemic, the riots, the everything else will kind of fade in the background. And we will long, and I know you do, because I believe every child of God that is redeemed by the blood of Jesus has a longing that God has hooked up in your heart to see the glory of God. Heaven itself is not nothing better than the glory of God. Uh, Revelation 21 talks about that you'll not eat the moon or the, or the sun in heaven because the glory of God will illumine the place. And we see what God is telling Moses. You know, you can't see God. Uh, the letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 16, talks about that no man can see God and live. And that's what God said to Moses. See, God is a spirit. But God has always given his presence in a glorious form, in a shekinah, shining glory all over the Old Testament. And the new of God's presence. And, and what it does to people, see, God being a spirit, we don't have the... The, the, the eyes, we, we you know in Bible, you know, you talks of God's God. hands and, and his eyes and his arms and all that, but that's just for our benefit. For God is far more than we can ever imagine no man him to be, God and live. far more that's glorious. But, but I believe if we can hook up on the glory of God and, God and make a determination that, that I'm going to look for the glory of God. Now, now, this may be a, a prelude to Labor Day, I don't know, but you're talking about a work. We ought to work to glorify God. Matthew 5, 16 says that we should work, that our good works that God gives us for the only purpose of glorifying Him, that they may see, the others might see these works and glorify God, uh, which is in heaven. May God help us to do that. And bless us. I want, I want to give you three words. I, I, I'm going to say these would be key words. The, the three things I want to try to say from this text. Number one is, is mention. Number two is magnify. And number three is mercy. Mention, magnify, and mercy. Now, they might not mean to, probably don't yet, but I pray that God would help us as we ask the Holy Spirit to put this together. The thing about looking for God's glory is this. God's going to have to show it to us. <laughs> we can't get it on ourselves. But I'm going to tell you, first of all, that it's amazing that Moses mentioned 
the very desire for God to show him his glory. I mean, can you think of a greater question to ask God than to show me your glory? <laughs> I, mean, that, I mean, that will make you shake in your shoes. I mean, it'll make a pen melt just to write it when you really think about what you're asking and who you're asking. But it came because Moses had faith in God. You see, the context here, Moses had some dialogue with God. See, you just don't jump off the stream with God right in the deep water. You see, God is progressive in our faith. Now, we're justified freely by his grace. But, but there's a progression of sanctification, of, of coming to the point where you're, you're, you're confident enough in God that you can ask him such a question. I wonder how many of us have ever mentioned, God, I want to see your glory. <laughs> I mean, Brother Mike prayed it for us through the Lord's Prayer as he reminded us. And think about how that prayer ends. As God leads us out of temptation, that his kingdom and his power and his glory would be manifest. Oh, man, we need to mention that so much. We need, to, we need to set our glory goals much, much higher than they are. Sometimes I think we, we think about our lives and say, Oh, God, will just give me this, help me do this, or get me out of this, or would you give me this? And we forget that what we need to be doing is asking God for glory. God, I want to see your glory. You know, I think we miss so much a lot when we don't look for his glory. You know, I remember in my life, and I remember, I want everybody here, whatever you do, I, I pray that you would have a, a, a renewed zeal into looking for God's glory right in what you do. Even if it's nothing, okay? You know, I was thinking in my past life, when I was walking in the woods a lot, I missed so much of God's glory. You know, I thought this morning, I remember, I remember down in Long County on the Omaha River and this beautiful, pristine timber track, and I worked for the landowner, and we prepared it for, for a timber sale, and I walked all around. And I remember about a month later, a guy called me one night representing a timber company who inspected it for the sale, and he said, Randy, did you know what? I found a stone axe right on Mr. Howard's track. I said, you did, a stone axe. Now, he, he dated it. This guy was into those kind of things. You see, you're going to have a hankering for what God's glory. He was looking for it. And he found a stone axe, and he dated it way back, you know, before the Indian. I mean, it was, it was amazing. He said, man, I'm so excited about this. Well, I'd probably walked all over it, you hear me? You know, I told you already about the time where, where I was recording uh, tree sizes on a tape recorder, a little handheld deal. And I got back in the house and I was, I was uh, uh, playing it back and, and writing down the data. And all I could hear were birds singing. See, I never heard those birds out in the woods. I, I want to ask you, see, that is how you look for the glory of God. So we're in a situation now, we need to look for the glory of God. You know how Moses got to this point? That, that he said, God, show me your glory. Look in your scriptures if you got them. If you got there with you. Look at uh, verse 13. Same chapter, Exodus 33. Now, therefore, here's Moses talking to God. Because of this, therefore, I pray thee, I beg thee, God, if I have found face or grace in thy sight, show me now thy way. You, you see what he's doing? He said, God, I want to see your way. God, I want to know what you want me to know. <laughs> I want to do, oh God, what you want me to do. 
See, you gotta, you got to see God. This is a progression. I want you to see it with me. Moses said, God, I want to know your way. And so when we really want to know God's way, then we can say, God, show me your glory. So the deal is how Moses got to this point of saying to God, show me your glory, is Moses was intimate with God. Because when you and I separate ourselves from sin, we get close to God. And we're able to talk to God. And we're able to be honest with God. And we're able to go to his throne of grace with boldness to find mercy for help in the time of need. But just as long as we are so concerned about our own glory, see, that is the key. God is going to have to kill our glory before we are going to look for his glory. So, so that is it. That is, I pray that God would help us to mention God's glory in your prayer, in your thought. You know, David said in Psalm 27, I mean, he was going through some tough times. David said, I would have fainted had, I not, had it not been, he says, for the glory of the God. If I have not seen, David said, the glory of God in the land of the living, Psalm 27, 13. That's what David said. See, what happens, I think sometimes we focus on the problem. And we focus on the situation and the circumstances. And we're not looking for God's glory. You remember Jesus said to the people that questioned about why was this little boy born, born blind? Why does this person have this affliction? Why do I have to go through this loss and hurt? You ever ask that? Well, you need to ask God to help us look for the glory of God in it. Because John 9, that's where you find that, in verse 3, Jesus said, the Lord Jesus said he was born blind. They thought that his parents might have sinned or some sin he committed. Don't think that when you go through problems and hurt in life that it is necessary all the time some sin you committed. It might just be that God wants you to see his glory. You hear me? Because that's what Jesus said. It says not because what he's done or haven't done or what his mama did or his daddy did. It's so that God would be glorified. See, all of our calling in this world is to glorify God. <laughs> that's all. That's why we're saved. And we need to thank him and bless this mind. Now, here, here's what I believe, and I don't know all about it. You know I don't know much. But I'm going to tell you this. I believe that the greatest need in this land today is looking diligently and fervently for the glory of God. Because here's the deal. When God's glory goes, God goes. And I hope you've already gathered from here what God's glory is, is his goodness. So, then if glory's gone, God is gone, and goodness is gone. See where we can get? And so, so we need to say, God, show me your glory. And as we get to the point we want to say, God, I want to know your way. I'm going to tell you right now, friends, if you're into work God's Word, and I believe there's more people into God's Word in this world today than I've ever known in my life. But if you're in God's Word, you are into His glory. You hear me? Because God says He's magnified His Word above all His name. God is serious about his word. Now, he had told these Israelites. See, the Israelites weren't any better than, than the Egyptians. They weren't a bit better. 
The only difference was God's grace. <laughs> and so God, though, they, they go into to, to, uh, bondage for 400 years. I mean, they're slaves for 400 years. Do you think that where did God's glory? Not a bit. I mean, everything created is God's glory. Did you know that God even created the devil for his glory? He did it. And all these situations that happen in our lives, do you think that they just accidentally come? No, no. God is glory. He is the God of glory. And what we need to do is not so much be in the, in the background as we need to be in the foreground of saying, God, I want to see your glory every day we get up. That ought to be the first thing on our prayer agenda. Oh, God, show me your glory today. Now, you might have all kinds of problems, but I'm going to tell you what, a problem does not make God's glory fade. It will magnify it. It'll do it. But you know what? We stumble around in life like I stumbled around them woods thinking about making money and impressing people, and we miss the very important part of life. We look for God's glory. We do it intentionally. See, we need to set, I, mean, I think I said this, we need to set your glory, God's, glory goals high. I'll tell you why. I think it's, keep your place there, but look at Psalm 24. I think that's where it is. I want you to see with me that we're approaching the king of glory. I mean, we're not to be just babbling about Jesus, about, oh, God, would you heal my little toe? We need to say, God, you can do anything. What did I say? Psalm 24. Look, look at verse 7. I'm going to read these last four verses of this wonderful psalm. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. See that. See, we come to the king, and we come to him praise. And we come because God has changed our principle by his amazing grace. And so now we have been convicted of sin, and we realize that we're sinners, and that we need a Savior. And then the Holy Spirit shows us that we have him. His name is Jesus. And we have God now as our Father. We have been adopted into his family by his mercy and grace. And so we can call on him and we can talk to him just like a little child does his dad. And we know that God loves us because he's proved it on the cross. So we go to God and we say, God, show me your glory. I want to see it. And remember how God answers that, let him go, okay? Because God's ways are not ours. They're not. And sometimes God doesn't say a thing. Doesn't mean he doesn't hear you. But you see, what he does to Moses, he puts him in a rock, in a cave. He conceals him. See, the secret things belong to God. It's so good, isn't it, that there's some things we do not know. I mean, God in his wisdom knows that. But don't let a day go by in your walk of faith that you don't mention 
God's glory. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying necessarily with words. See, you can preach the gospel, which is preaching glory, and you don't have to use words. You use it with your life. You use it with your response. You use it with, with how you react to the world and to the situations in life. So, so you miss it. I said, you know, we have set our glory goals. I know I have two small. I pray that I'll never again try to say, God, I want to preach good today. I don't want to preach good. I want God to be glorified. I pray that this church will say, God, whatever you do with us, Make sure we see your glory. See in your marriage, if you're a married person, don't ever say, oh God, help me, let's, let's make this a happy marriage. If that is your number one goal, then you probably won't make it. But if you say, God, make this a marriage that glorifies you, you watch it. You'll show your glory. Or your work. Oh, God, I'm not just trying to make this money. Just to pile it up so that people will see me. What I want to do, God, is I want you to use my work to glorify you. Now, you watch what he'll do with that. See, it takes guts, though, to ask God to show you his glory. I mean, I mean, it comes from God. <laughs> I mean, Joshua prayed that God would make the sun stand still. Where did that come from? <laughs> I'll tell you, it comes from God. Here's the deal before I leave this point. That, that really should make us shake in our shoes. Given the name of Jesus and God's glory is so defamed in our world today. I was reading, and God shows his glory in so many places. He showed it in the Garden of Eden. But Adam and Eve didn't have nothing to do with it. God had to push them out. Because his glory could not abide with sin. God had it in the tabernacle. You know, in the Old Testament, you know where God's glory was sitting over the mercy seat. And in that tabernacle, God told them where to put it, put it right in the middle of the camp. And, and, and the Bible says that, that God's presence was like a great light. It shone with glory. Why? Because God wanted his glory in the center. And that's where you give the cloud by day and the, and the pillar of fire by night because that was his glory. And when people saw the glory of God, they, they moved and were moved and they worshipped. But I was reading in the temple in Ezekiel. And chapter 9, 10, and 11. And, and I was thinking, this is so amazing. But, but God, when God's glory departs, it is progressive, but it is total. And what Moses was saying in our text, see, God had told him earlier in this chapter, God said to Moses, I'm not going to go with you. I'm not going to put it, I'm putting, I'm putting this in my mouth, but in my words, but God was saying, I'm not going to put it with you any longer. I mean, I'm not going to fool around with these people that are rebellious. God says, I've already told you that I'm giving you the promised land. I've already parted the Red Sea. And these people have the audacity to doubt God. And so Moses has gone up in the mount to get a message from God about how they ought to live called the Ten Commandments. And because he stayed a little long, the people said, I don't know what happened to Moses, but I want to build me something to worship. They convinced the heirs, the saints, them building a calf. These people that God had brought out of bondage, these people that had cried out to God, and he heard their cry, and God delivered them. 
You know, God says in Psalm 50, 15, he says, call upon me in the time of trouble, and I will deliver you, and thou shalt glorify me. I think sometimes we forget that part, don't you? You remember the ten lepers that were cleansed? You know what Jesus said about that? He says, were they not ten cleansed? But there's only one. This stranger, he said, I think he used, that come back to glorify me. But in Ezekiel, I mentioned that. When you read that, I don't ask you, you have to put all those verses, but you kind of search them out in those chapters. What happens, God's glory, because of the sin of people in the temple. See, God's glory moved. I never read this verse before, and I don't remember it anyway. See, God's glory moved from, say, say, say this was the pulpit or maybe uh, the Ark of the Covenant, whatever. God moves and His Spirit moves His glory to the door. Chapter 10. Chapter 11, the, the Bible says God's glory left the church completely. And the next thing we see of God's glory is up on the mountain. And the Bible says they departed. The glory of God departed. Now, that, that is what makes me shake. That is what says, oh, God, show me your glory. And I want you to say it with me. I pray that God would give us that heart as God gives it to us. God, I want to see your glory more than anything else. In my children, in my grandchildren, in the church, in my problems, in my weakness. I mean, Paul's thorn of flesh was not removed. You know why? So, so that he would glory in the power of God. See, the only thing that you can remember is that when you go through problems and hurt in life, you remember the power of God. And when you remember the power of God, you glorify it. God says, open your mouth wide and I'll, I'll fill it. Okay. I said magnify covered some of that already but when you think about magnifying God's glory I think about a magnifying glass I mean you just focus on it and when you do it it can create energy I mean you start looking for God's glory I mean something intentional now that you say God I want you to show me your glory see see what happened again I, I was saying in this chapter uh, God says, I'm not going to go with you. Here's the promised land. You can have it. What God was saying is you can have the promised land. I'm just not going to be a part of it. Moses then puts in that begging, pleading prayer, oh God. What he's saying in so many words is, God, I don't want it if you're not going to be with us. Oh God, don't leave us. These are your people. God, this is your church. You stay with us, oh God, because whatever we have, if we don't have God with us, we don't have anything. I mean, you got to wonder if God can really bless America. You know? Given how much we neglect His glory. I wonder. But I can tell you this. If we as a people, I'm going to write in this little sanctuary. It says, God, I want you to take me, and I want you to use me, and I want you to help me, Lord. Show me your glory. It don't take a big army for God to use for victory. What it does take is people that God can trust in handling his glory. Did you hear me? Can God trust us in handling his glory? See, Gideon's army started off pretty big. What did God do? Just reduce them down to about, what, 300 men? Why? Because God is showing us that the battle is the Lord's. <laughs> it's not our glory. The strength of Gideon's army was that every person was in his place. And so when we're in our place, means like Moses, we say, God, I want to know your way. That's the place for me. 
I don't give a rip what everybody else is doing. God, what do you want me to do? Like the Apostle Paul in Acts 9, 6, when God got through with him on the road to Damascus, he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And that is getting us focused to the glory of God. Number two, magnify. That's how you magnify God. We praise God. Now, when you're looking for God's glory, you've got to look for something you can't see. See, that's where faith kicks in. See, faith is the, uh, is, uh, is the result of, of what you understand about God and His Word. I mean, our faith needs to grow. See, you, you with God, you work with God, you walk with God. It's like riding a bicycle. See, you don't just stand still. You're going to fall. See, again, Moses said, God, I want you to know, now I want to see your glory. And it's not, it's not that Moses was being presumptuous, not that Moses was trying to be hard to please. What Moses was saying, God, I want you. I want to know more about you. I want to bless your holy name. You know, the apostle Peter didn't understand what Jesus meant when he's talking about his suffering. And Jesus says, Peter, as much words, I'm talking about the death in which you glorify me. See, we glorify God. We need to say, God, show me your glory even in my death. I mean, we tried to say that yesterday with Henry Smith. He didn't live a perfect life, neither did he in the water. But I'm going to tell you this, by the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ and by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the object of that faith being hooked up with him, I'm going to say that is a glory. And that needs to be magnified. 2 Corinthians 4. You know, the apostle Paul says these light afflictions in verse 17, but for a moment. But there's a purpose in them. We talked about that a while ago. The trials you have in me, you know, there's a purpose in them. And what Paul is saying there, the Apostle Paul is saying, these light afflictions are but for a moment, says, while they work in us. A far greater weight of glory. While we look, not at things we can see, but things we can't see. See, so if you're looking at me, looking for the Lord, going God, we're going to look at something we can't see. But I'm going to tell you one. I, I don't know if I might have said this, I don't know, last Sunday. I can't keep up with it all, but I'm going to tell you this. If you start looking at something, people will look at what you're looking at. You can go right on to Statesboro, the streets of Statesboro, and you start looking up, and you watch it. People start looking up, too. I mean, if we start looking for the glory of God, I'd just rather suspect some other people might start looking for it, too. I mean, we need, to, we need to sure give that example to our children. We need to give that example to one another. To magnify. And so that power comes through. And then lastly, God's mercy. God's mercy. I want you to look at something with me. Man, when mercy kicks in, glory kicks in. You know what mercy is, don't you? Mercy is getting or not getting what we do deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Now, I want you to notice with me how God put this all together. In verse 19, here's God's answer to Moses. He wants to see his glory. And I believe that would be his answer to me and you. Okay? He says, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. See, that's what God's glory is, his goodness. I suppose it would take my entire lifetime and more to just think about all God's goodness. Have you thought about how good God is lately? I've had so many people say that to me. God is so good. That is his glory. And he says, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Now here's a great formula to see God's glory. See, grace comes before mercy. 
16 where you see grace plus mercy plus the sovereignty of God, you got glory. That's what you got. See, see what, what God is saying, and this is what makes us look for his, 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 his mercy. The people, Israelites, had already, had already abused his grace. I want you to know how many of us, how many times this little preacher has, 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 has just run all over God's grace. Time and time again, I've had to go to God's throne of grace and ask him to forgive me for the sins that I committed a few days before. You know what? Conviction is nothing but God's mercy. If God can convict you and drive you to shame, it is a gift of his great mercy because you're about to see his glory. And until we get to the point that we're on our knees, and we understand that, oh God, I have not been what you've called me to be by your grace. God saved us by his grace, but he shows us his glory by his mercy. Okay? That's what God does. His mercy. You know, the Pharisee and the publican in Luke's gospel. Here's that Pharisee. See, God hadn't killed the glory of himself yet. He said, look, at, look what I do. I go to church three times a week. I read your Bible. I tithe. And here's that publican who didn't even feel worthy to go in the church. He stands out there and he beats his breast and he says, God, have mercy upon me. that guy saw God's glory you know when you see something you gotta you gotta know the angle you look at it's real real important of the perception you get for it. you know we were in Israel a few years ago and they took us to a place that uh, where Christ was crucified and on the side of the mountain was Golgotha you know the rock the mount and so the guide said do you look at that rock? Do you see the face of Jesus? I'm usually pretty shy and still am, but I said, no, I don't really see it. He said, well, let's get over this area. And so we walk about 40 or 50 feet over, and you get a little different angle, you can see it. I'm going to tell you, when you really want to see the glory of God, you've got to get right up under the cross. And you see Jesus suffering and bleeding and his blood dripping down that cross for your sins. And you will be like that centurion soldier. Surely, this man is the Son of God. Because when you see Jesus, you have seen God's glory. And one day, Jesus is coming back. Now, he's not coming back like he came the first time. It's a little baby in Bethlehem. He's coming victorious, the Lord of glory. And people will bow before him. And every tongue will confess him. And the sin debt will be handled Finally, either in hell eternally or in heaven by the cross of Calvary. And we'll praise him and we'll give him glory. But until then, we say, God, show me your glory. I pray that God would give us that inspiration. See, we don't need to be so concerned about ah, what I'm going to say, you know, knowing all the deep, dark things of the Bible. I mean, there's some good things in there. I mean, there's some things I don't understand. I'll tell you the truth. But, you know, there's no need for us to get bogged down in, in predestination and as glorious it is. And, and responsibility, human responsibility and God's will. <laughs> what we need to do is love God. I mean, God says, love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What he says is, 
designed for my glory. Because if you really love me, you'll want to see my glory. Because you have glory in you in Christ. Okay? You know, Job struggled a little bit. A lot, really. I mean, everything happened to him the way it did. But you know, he saw God's glory. When God reminded him, Job, where were you when I made this universe? You know, there's a lot I don't understand about God's creation. I don't know how deep the ocean is. You know, I walked down there the other day with my family on the, on the seashore at Tide. I look out there and I say, you know, I don't understand this, God. How big is the ocean? How deep is it? What's in it? But you know what? In a moment, I, got, I caught myself saying, I don't have to know all that to enjoy the waves and the breeze and the soft smell. I don't. I could just appreciate God. And I say, God, this is your glory. <laughs> That's what it is. May the Lord bless me. Say, God, show me your glory. And make others know that where they're looking for the glory of God or not, you will be. Because God says, if you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. What a blessing. Find the glory of God through his goodness, his sovereignty, and his mercy. Would you bow with me? We thank you, most precious Heavenly Father, for your glory. Oh God, I pray that you have gotten glory out of this sermon. I know it's not much, but Lord, you're good at taking little things and making glorious things out of them. I pray for this church. I pray for your people. I pray for our nation, our president. I pray, oh Lord, that we'd get back to knowing our calling to glory glorifying you and enjoying you all the days of our lives. Oh, forgive us, God, for neglecting your glory. Thank you so much for your mercy. And in spite of the fact that we profane your amazing grace, you've not given up on us. Thank you, Lord, that your mercy is just like your glory and endures forever. May you be glorified is our prayer this morning. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Appreciate your being here today.